Great stuff. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Ian, uh, co-founder of MadFest. Um, welcome to the 99 Club Digital Festival. This is day four of our week-long festival uh, with our friends uh, from NDA. Um, the event has two apps, as you will have heard many times already this week. You're watching me, I guess, on the web app on your laptop, which is by far the best way of enjoying the content and seeing Justin's beautiful face throughout the afternoon, along with our lovely speakers. Um, if you want to network and really um, play a massive role in the event, then jump onto our mobile app. Uh, and get meeting people, get swapping details, take part in the competition. Today's competition is Pets Win Prizes, so we'd love to see your pets at home up on the uh, virtual pub message board. Uh, I'm talking to you from the bar, of our partners, we're helping, uh, we're at the Gidding Room today, uh, helping uh, help refugees, um, a very good cause that we wanted to get involved with. And if you'd like to get involved and donate them a little money, please use the QR code you see behind me. And um, I'm sure we'll be able to show that to you more times as the afternoon goes on. So without further ado, let me hand you over to our wonderful host who's been doing every single day for us this week, um, Justin, the editor of NDA, along with his business partner and able right-hand man, Andy Oakes. Over to you guys, take it away. Hi everyone, welcome to day four, the best day so far, obviously. So in taking you through all the logistical details you need to know, uh, what you've got to do is sit back and relax and watch the amazing content. We've got incredible speakers today, kicking off with Vicky Maguire in a minute. So what's the most important thing? The most important thing is questions. Uh, bottom of your screen, you'll see a little Q&A icon. You click on that and send in your questions. We'll pick some of the best and put them to speaker after each 99 seconds. Each speaker has just 99 seconds. Uh, if they go over 99 seconds, they get horned off like, well. <laughs> Now it's working like that. Uh, and then you'll get a chance to have your questions answered. Uh, there's lots of other stuff going on today we'll talk about later. Andy will talk about polls and competitions and will. cats win, cats in tiny hats as we renamed the, the competition today. Uh, the networking, there's lots of stuff happening beyond the amazing speakers, but the main focus is on our speakers. We've lined up some incredible people today. I'm quite amazed how we've got so many amazing people in five days. We had 99 speakers in total. We're now down to 41, I think. Uh, so we run up until five o'clock today. It's really fast and furious. It doesn't stop. We're absolutely exhausted, but it's gonna be another great day. So in a second, I'm gonna hand over to our first speaker. It's Vicky Maguire, who's Chief Creative Officer at Havas, with the most intriguing title we've had so far, I think. What punk? can teach us about marketing. So again, uh, remember the questions at the bottom of your screen. Uh, there is a prize for the best question today. I think, again, it's one of Andy's jars of homemade marketing. Yes, it is. Yes, good. So, uh, okay, let's, I think, Vicky, are you ready? I'm ready. Amazing. Remember, you've got 99 seconds and that's it, or you will get horned off. Shit. 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 The clock, we're going to start in 30 seconds or so. Uh, let's hold on. Everyone's waiting. Okay. We're gonna go now, Vicky. Over to you. Oh my God! Right. Okay. Things are pretty fucked up at the moment. We can feel that, right? But you and you are gonna see loads of think pieces and opinions and all of that kind of stuff. But you know what? What do they know? So, in my opinion, forget people that think they know how to navigate our way out of this. They've never been in this situation. Been the Byron Sharp ditch the neuro and the Wilwood Brown and look for people who have navigated their way successfully through this kind of shit, right? Bin the books, get on Spotify, dig out your vinyl and start listening to punk, right? Just think about it. Punk came out, there was a three day week. It was a cold war. There was a recession. There was racism. There was anarchy in the UK, right? Fast forward 40 years. And what do we get? We get COVID. We get chaos. We get recession. We've got anarchy in the UK again, right? So let's learn from those who made it work for them. Let's learn from the Sex Pistols. Let's learn from polystyrene. Let's learn from Malcolm McLaren, right? All of these people had common traits, right? They were uncompromising. They had a point of view. 
they had an authentic voice. They had a support, you know, they had support from their fans and their customers and they didn't sell out. Right. So if we look today at the people that are really making this kind of situation work for them, Brewdog, Patagonia, like even Yorkshire tea, you know, your nan's favorite brew has taken a stand against racism. That's like classic punk behavior. Right. So whether or not, you know, whether you're a client, whether you're a brand or whether you're a creative, my tips are find your voice, stand for something. Yes. Yeah? Speak up stand out don't sell out yeah these are interesting times this is where culture and context are colliding make it work for you so fuck the naysayers fuck the system and as sid vicious said just do it your way okay. fuck, i've done it in the time amazing. you're a bit over but i thought well you know it's you to start of the day so we gave you a bit of leeway tiny bit over but vicky thank you so much an amazing start today now, lots of questions coming in, and I picked some of the best, as always. There's one here from Anna, and do you know what's the sort of one I put, it was me as well. We've had lots of talk in the last three days about the need for authenticity and finding your own voice and having a point yep. of view, all things you mentioned. But as Anna says, what if um, our company hasn't really got its point of view set up? Is it too late to now come in and start talking about all these important issues? Not a, no, 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 no. Go back to why your, why your company was created. You will find your tone of voice in your company's DNA, right? And that will allow, that will tell you what you can have an opinion on, right? Whether, you know, are you the kind of brand that can tell people to keep washing their hands or are you like some of the worst stuff I've seen when a cheese tells you to stay at home and you're like, fuck, mate, read the room. Yeah, you'll find it in you'll find it in your brandy, you'll find it in your company ethos and what your company really stands for, and you will know whether or not you can kind of, you know, you can step into those conversations and have a meaningful conversation around that. Does that make sense? All right, total sense. Brilliant reply. Uh, let's have a quick. This is a sort of a, a an unserious one, or maybe serious from from Ed Preedy. What's Vicky's favourite punk record? Oh, oh my God, I love. So there's a band that came out of Leicester. Right. And they were called uh, Crazy Head and you won't have heard of them, but they used they had this thing. Um, was it Frigging in the Rigging? That was one of my faves. Uh, Drill Your Own Hole. That was one of theirs as well. But I'm, I'm a massive polystyrene fan. I loved X-Ray Specs. So anything by them. Amazing. Let's have now a question from Gemma, who says, uh, which brands have tried to be more punk and failed terribly? Oh, any brand that has ligged on to and tried to do me too, but not in the kind of creepy, touchy sense um, that have tried to force their way into something that's happening and haven't had and shouldn't be speaking in that way. I think L'Oreal's a really good example. They came out with for Black Lives Matters, but then they got rid of one of their kind of black trans models 18 months ago for speaking out against uh you know one of the black shootings in in the states you know and now they've had to massively backtrack and you are like guys read the room find your authentic self and know where you can have those conversations Great. question here from emma who says what's the most exciting great exciting creative trend you've seen emerge over the last three months well i think i think that one of the most exciting trends i've seen is that Anybody can get anything on air now, doesn't matter how much money they've got, right? If you look at the, some of the stuff that's coming out of ITV, when they've turned all of their kind of, uh, all of their media space really, to creators to say thank you and stuff like that. And I know it sounds trite and I know we're kind of over that kind of, uh, that iPhone shot footage, but, but when you watch that and you watch it back, you're like, yeah, actually that's really super smart. I also like brands that realized that they couldn't open and turned their premises or their skills to do good. Like Barber, uh, opening their factories and, and, you know, and sewing masks and PPE for hospitals and stuff like that. That makes me feel really good about that brand. Amazing. Okay, next one from Holly. She asks, is there a difference between rocking the boat, being different and being outright controversial? Um, 
I think both I think both of those things are wrong and right at the same time. You have to have context. You cannot be the brand that comes out and acts like a twat, um, you know, just for the sake of it. Yeah, because it's, it's look, this is no different. This is no different than going to a bar. There's always a knob at the end of the bar that has got an opinion on everything and nobody wants to hang out with them. Right. But there's always another, you know, there's always somebody else at the other end of the bar who doesn't say anything until he's got something or she's got something really smart to say. Be that person. Don't be the twat. Excellent analogy. Uh, it's a mix between music and creativity questions. So the next one's on the music. Uh, Richard said, who, in your opinion, was the most influential punk band? My left field take is not the obvious ones. But oh, just... interesting, interesting, interesting. Look, I thought, the, I thought the Pistols with McLaren behind them were incredible. I think the clash and kind of how they, you know, how they spawned a thousand imitators or just got people to pick up a band, pick up a, an instrument and play were incredible. The band that I really, really liked that I know had a massive influence in its kind of home country is something, uh, Oh God, what is his name? Fergal Sharkey from The Undertones. Okay. Um, incredible, absolutely incredible. Every little kid in, you know, in Ireland wanted to be in a punk band after they, after they watched Teenage Kicks on Top of the Pops. And taking that anarchy onto like a, you know, onto Top of the Pops, which was seven o'clock on a Thursday and you're sitting there watching it with your dad and your mum and your nan, amazing. So yeah. That's it. Okay, next question from Mickey who asks, if marketers the world over adopt punk marketing, won't it become mainstream and therefore not really punk? Yes, it will. But the ones that do it right, the ones that do it first and the ones that do it well, like punk, 40 years on, we are still talking about people like the Sex Pistols when half of you lot, a quarter of you lot weren't born. Right, I've got knickers older than most of you and I am really, really proud of my punk roots. But when punk... It comes out of the out of the cult and into the mainstream nature doesn't like a vacuum right and it will fill it with another movement so you should always keep an eye on what happens next excellent question here for instance, from donald who says uh oh why would big brands who haven't taken risks start taking them now surely this is the totally wrong time no, I th it's not so much of taking, like, I don't believe in risky advertising. I don't believe in brave advertising. I believe in right advertising, right? And if you are a big brand and at the heart of your DNA is something good, then big brand, it's only when big brands make a stand that other people start to notice. Does that make sense? Yeah. When somebody like, I'm just trying to think of a really good example. Uh, when somebody like Nike, come out and they still kind of support Kaepernick if when they come out and say you know don't do it when the biggest retail you know when the biggest shoe manufacturer comes out and says don't buy our stuff if you are a racist then then that gets noticed I mean take you know I you know I mentioned Yorkshire tea and their don't drink us if you're a racist stuff that was one tweet that is one tweet that has got so much kind of earned media they couldn't buy that amount of goodwill that they they're having at the moment, but they're a, they're a big, I'm going to say dusty brand, but they made a stand and good on them. A question here from Betty. She says, you mentioned Brewdog in your, in your talk, but what about all the brands that have got it wrong around things like Black Lives Matter? I mean, I, I think we, as, a, as a punters, as consumers, I don't think we have ever had as much power and a say as we have today, right? And the strongest thing that you can do is vote with your purse, right? If you don't like what your brand, if you don't like what a brand is doing, you don't buy it. It's as simple as that. And it will, and it will kill them and it will absolutely crucify them and they have to get on the right side. So if you don't like, you know, I don't like, I don't like the way, let's say my favorite cheese came out and told me to stay at home, but eat cheese. Fuck you. There's a p pandemic going on and you were trying to sell cheese off the back of people dying, right? No, I'm not having it. I've moved. And that's the, that's the best thing that you could possibly do. Perfect. We're up against time, so just as one comment here rather than a question. Jinx says, you're my pants idol, Vicky. Just oh, my old pants idol. I'll buy that. Thank you very much, Jinx.
But Vicky, amazing, fantastic, the perfect start for today's festival. Thank you so much for your time and answering those questions. Thanks for having me. Bye. Bye bye, thanks. Right now we're moving on. Great, 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 great start today. So now we're moving on to an old friend of mine, actually, uh, Ben Carter. He's director of director of strategic partnerships at Just Eat. We first met a long time ago when we were working together on New uh, Media Age magazine. So Ben's talk is women's football: why brands are missing a trick. Ben, good to see you again. It's been a long time. You've got, and even though we haven't seen each other for a long time, I'm still going to horn you off after 99 seconds. So you have 99 seconds, which is starting now. Great to see you, Justin. And how the hell do I follow that? Right. Uh, women's football. So just a quick one. Women in football is an organisation and we're committed to making football a level playing field from pitch to boardroom. I'm hugely passionate about it and I'm the only member of, the, sorry, only male member of the board. So look, women's football is at a tipping point. It's currently in a forced hiatus because of coronavirus, but it's got a unique opportunity to come back even bigger and better. Fan growth in the men's professional game has plateaued, whilst before COVID, women's football was seeing significant growth. Record attendances, 77,000 people watching England Germany at Wembley, and a near 200% increase, sorry, 200% increase in attendances at WSL matches, including 38,000 for the, for the North London derby, Arsenal, Tottenham. But perhaps the most compelling stat is the audience engaging with women's football is a 50-50 split between men and women. And as we've seen with the growing popularity of the Lionesses, it's really popular and a great platform for young women and young families. We're also seeing a pull forward from the men's game. We've seen great examples of professional clubs starting to promote teams as one club. But clearly the elephant in the room is TV viewing figures are low. And despite increasing focus and investment from broadcasters, there is a big gulf. But this is changing. This shouldn't put off brands. Women's football is a cost-effective platform that gives brands true immersive and full access into clubs in a way you can only dream about with the men's professional game. It's a fantastic purpose-driven platform that gives you direct access to ready-made communities. Look at Nielsen's data. A fifth of the population is more influenced by sponsors of women's sport than men. And 63% of the population believe brands should invest in both. Still need convincing? It's a true differentiator. It's the opportunity to be at the vanguard. It's not going to be here forever. We've seen a few brands engaged, Barclays, Boots, Disney, and Visa. And if you want inspiration, look at what Vitality did with Netball. They got in early and funded the sport to become professional. Not a bad you role model. You're not stopping. You finished. You, you're not saying <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. I horned you off, but you're still talking, which is the first. Yeah. So congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> that's the privilege of being your former colleague, Justin. Yeah, that's just that's true. That's true. You're allowed. Okay, great. Night on second chat, and loads of questions coming in. Uh, guess one here from Yogi, who asks, "What do you think of the return of the Premiership? Is it going to work?" Uh, absolutely, it will work, but we're disappointed that women's football hasn't returned and we're disappointed that we've got to wait till September. I think it should be a level playing field. I think there should have been a return, as there has been in Germany, of the men and women's professional game. Great. OK, uh, and Olaf, I think it's Olaf, asks, when it comes to Just Eat, what have you been most heartened by or surprised by over the last three months? Been most heartened by the response and the reaction of our restaurants. Just Eat is nothing without our restaurant partners. We've got 35,500 in the UK. We've seen amazing acts of donating food to the NHS that we have done and our restaurants have done, but also the fact that they've had to completely adapt their trading model. They've, they've had to operate on skeleton staff. They've had to deal with social distancing, but they've managed to keep operating. So I think their resilience is a credit to the real national effort against coronavirus. Excellent question from Andy asks, what are Just Eat doing within women's football? So Just, so just Eat this year have made a big move into football and we, and, and we are looking seriously at women's football. I'm, I'm no longer the marketing director, so that's no longer in my gift. Um, <laughs> but I am lobbying my former colleagues very hard on women's football and I'm hopeful you will see us in women's football sooner rather than later. Amazing. Okay, I think last question we've got time for from Edie, Edie, uh, the gap between WSL and the championship is huge in terms of talent and budget. Do you think the more sponsorships will further this or bridge the gap? So I think two things have to, have to happen, Edie. I think it's about the, 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 the male professional clubs getting behind their women's teams properly, 
not as not 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 as almost a, a distraction, but being part of the core teams. I think also we need broadcasters to actually improve the production quality of what we're, we're seeing, both in terms of WSL and Championship. And then you want to see sponsorships basically cross both WSL and Championship so that funding goes into grassroots. Perfect, Ben. Absolutely amazing. Great to see you. Great talk and great question answering. Thank you so much for your time. See you soon. Thank you, guys. In two seconds time, we have Penny Parnell, who's the creative director of Not On The High Street. Uh, she's got a great entitled talk saying why the future of creativity should be fueled by the entrepreneurial spirit. Penny, you now have 99 seconds. It's over to you. Great, thank you. Well, at Not On The High Street, we work with 5,000 of the UK's best small creative businesses, and they have been giving us a masterclass in creativity uh, with their entrepreneurial spirit. So next slide, please. Um, so according to Matt Ehrlichman, there are five signs of this. And the first one is have passion. So be driven by purpose. So you work because you want to change the world. And this is our partner, Love Lux London, who makes sustainable clothes because she really believes in saving the planet, for example. Secondly, push for better. Uh, this is another of our partners, My Little Desk, and they realised that during the pandemic, there were loads of kids who were being homeschooled that didn't have anywhere to work. So she created these cardboard desks and has been helping lots of people and they've been going great guns. Thirdly, remain optimistic. So actually, uh, loads of businesses were set up in a recession on a shoestring. Uh, this is one of our partners, Motherhood. She set up her business on just £400 because she wanted to... Um, she wanted to empower women. So actually 82% of our small businesses are female led businesses. So it's possible. Uh, fourthly, take calculated risks. Um, so uh, this is another of our partners, Modo Creative, uh, who make these signs and they hated the rat race, uh, really wanted to spend more time with family. So they did their research, set up their business and are now one of our million pound partners. Um, and finally, just get on with it. So another one of our partners, Clouds and Currents, she set up the business making these. She had a really bad leg injury, had to stop working. Did she moan? No, she just flipping got on with it. And that's brilliant. So next slide, um, let's learn from them. Let's support them. It's entrepreneurial spirit that's gonna get us out of this. So go small or go home, even though you're probably at home. Amazing, wow. Well, they <laughs> I talk really fast. <laughs> Fantastic. A lot of questions. Uh, the first one, I think lots of people will be thinking this, from Tolkien, how can I nurture the, entre the entrepreneurial spirit at my company? <laughs> that's, a really, that's a very good question, Tolkien. I actually know Tolkien. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think really it's just uh, the, the last side probably sell, uh, sums it up. It's having more of that rebellious spirit um, and just doing things your way. So just always sort of questioning the status quo and, um, and finding your own path through it. Amazing. Uh, question here from Freddie. Do you feel creative products are more important than creative marketing? Good question. That's a really good question. I think both is the sweet spot, to be honest. I mean, um, we obviously are sort of famous for having really unique creative products on our site. Um, but at the same time, I think, again, actually, if you look at small businesses, they've been doing a fantastic job of just really, really marketing things their way. I suppose they're sort of questioning, um, there's more freedom now than ever. So why sort of invest in a billboard if the words on the streets are stronger? You know, it's there's a real sort of, um, rebellious creative spirit coming out and I think we can learn a lot from that so a, a bit of both to be honest is the is the honest answer to that I thought Emily's crisps did a brilliant job with their most recent campaign so they um, uh, crisps that are sold through a lot of independent retailers and they'd already bought out of home space and probably all have seen this but um, what are you going to do with a billboard when nobody's on the streets? So um, rather than that, they changed their messaging to be really, really human um, and just sort of tap into what everybody was feeling. And of course, it got picked up and shared really, really widely. So I think it's just being creative and entrepreneurial with the space as much as anything else. Amazing. You've had lots of comments about you, your background. So congratulations. <laughs> That's very kind. Yeah. We've got too many questions to go through, but uh, this is one I think sort of echoes lots of people. Darren asks, what do you think the high street will look like post COVID in three years time? It's a really good question. I think um, sadly it's going to have changed a heck of a lot as we can all imagine. I think um, almost we've just done a survey half of all small businesses are going to really struggle to be alive. They don't think they're going to still be going in a year's time. Um, so I think it's really, really important that we support small more than ever. They've seen us through um, the pandemic. For them, they didn't have to learn to work from home because loads of them are doing it anyway. You know, we should really just follow their lead. I think it's going to be very, very different. I think there'll be a lot more online retail, but um, just support small. 
that's what I'd say. Penny, we're up against time. Thank you so much. Amazing talk and great question Thank answering. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks very much. Now we're moving on to everyone's favourite part of the day. It's the poll master. So we're talking about polls and I think some artwork. Do you want to talk about art? Uh, yeah, let's start with polls. Um, I don't like the poll master word. <laughs> poll master. <laughs> Um, today, uh, the first poll on the site is, can you automate creativity? Um, with yes, AI is the future. Uh, no, you need the human touch. And uh, finally, AI will only work for certain brands. A lot of creatives listening today, obviously, um, as no, you need the human touch is scorching away with 74% um, of the response there. And in terms of the artwork, um, if we can cut to that, please, that'd be brilliant. Um, you may have seen this yesterday and the day before if you've been listening in, but we've got a live graphical representation of what's been happening uh, with the talks, all put together by the brilliant team at Blind Mice. You'll have to take my word for the fact it's brilliant because you're not seeing it yet. Hey, look, one behind us, this is from our last event, the first actual physical event. There's a virtual one being done. I'll tell you what, it'll be really good when we come back to it later in the day, won't it? Well, that's just a teaser. It's a teaser. What about our competition renamed? Cats and tiny hats. Um, I would urge people to go to the pub part of the app. There must be 20 photos of uh, ridiculous dogs, cats, um, a gerbil in there as well. Um, it's fantastic. I think we've tried to be serious. We've tried to really nail it with a lot of great stuff here, but it turns out, give people what they want and they want animals. Anything that rhymes, hogs on logs, dogs on hogs, that sort of thing will do well. Uh, the other things to talk about quickly, we've got lots of, although there's amazing content all through the day, there's lots going behind the scenes, as Andy's saying, there's competitions, there's a networking, networking competition. There is, um, connect with as many people as possible. Oh, we have artwork. Here's the artwork. Slick, we are slick. <laughs> slick is my middle name. It's actually David, but we'll move on. Look at that, that's beautiful. That's what we've had just from three, four sessions. So some really good stuff. Uh, as I said, these guys are called Three Blind Mice. You should employ them for all of your events because they're amazing. Um, we'll be putting this on the New Digital Age site. We will. Um, at the start of next week, I believe. Uh, networking, we have to mention networking. The, the, the main, one of the best things about Madfest events in the real world is all the networking. It goes on all the time throughout the day. We're doing the same thing virtually. If you go to the app, you can meet people and network if you... Seems a bit strange, but shake your phone and then you can connect with people. Uh, so go on there. And as well as meeting amazing people, as well as watch them on the screen today, you can also win the networker competition and you win prizes. I think we're about to go to our next amazing speaker now. We've got two minutes left. Anything else to mention? I suppose the pizza, don't forget the pizza. Oh, on Friday, Friday, we're giving away Friday, which is tomorrow. I've sort of lost what day we're in. And in fact, thanks to Ben, Ben Carter, who just yes. spoke two speakers back. You get, if you go and they give us your address, it's not for Andrew to turn up and look through a window. That may happen, but it's two. Um, we will, yeah, we're gonna give you pizza. So one, possibly two, looking for any guidance from the team. Getting none, four people, brilliant. Four people we'll be sending pizza to. So yes, Jay Richards, we can see you're keen for pizza. <laughs> That's, we, we've got the chat right up here. So send in your addresses, somehow I believe it's on the app. And a golden ticket, there's a golden ticket and one pizza box to win loads more exciting prices. All thanks to Ben. Excellent. Well, more of this slickness later, but I think we should probably go to a speaker. I think we should slip over. Okay. So let's <laughs> move to our next speaker. She is incredible. She is inspirational. She is Mary Keen Dawson. She was on with us yesterday, the day before, I'm sort of losing track as well. She has got a talk now entitled Creativity by the Creators. Mary, I will horn you off after 99 <laughs> seconds. I promise. Right, in the meantime, it's now over to you. Hello, everybody. How are you? Um, well, today I'm just going to speak for 99 seconds on a challenge I wish to make to the advertising industry orthodoxy of what we believe qualifies you to be creative. And since I became a group CEO of Takumi, I have been involved with and witnessed some of the greatest creative work I've ever seen. But one of the things that I think I want to make a point about today is just how important it is to connect with your audience. And creators have to do that every day of the week, day in, day out, because that's how they know and have their followings. And that's how they know and grow their audiences. And most importantly of all, that is how they connect with the power of and the belief systems of the people that they work with and for. 
So Creativity by Creators, I recommend you all take a really good look at because these are just a few examples of our creators. They're everything from magicians to uh, journeymen and women and creators who dance, sing, do voiceovers and what have you. And they're hugely entertaining and incredible fun. And they know better than anybody what their audience wants and needs. So please take a look at TikTok and Instagram and find some new fun. Thank you. Mary, amazing. We could nice five seconds. It's fantastic. So we've got the questions coming in. Anyone else watching or listening? The Q and A button top of your screen. Give me your question. I'll put them to Mary. So the first question here we've got from Patrick, who says, "Mary, there have been lots of scandals involving influencers and fake metrics over recent years. How far do you think we've improved in the situation?" Well, I think the situation is massively improved um, from the perspective of all of the reputable. Um, platforms and agencies that work in this space because we audit every influencer's uh, audiences very rigorously and therefore fake followers get spotted immediately and we don't work with those guys so you know and if we do find fake followers on, on a on anybody's account we just we tell them to, to sort it out and clean it up and that's it's as simple as that you can't work with with creators that have fake followers that's it a uh, question from Lawrence who asks, how can brands approach influencer marketing on new platforms? Big question. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, you know, essentially why it's good to work with an agency that understands what the strengths and the weaknesses and the opportunities are of the platforms. Uh, I think also the briefing process with creators. I, you know, it's, it's very different from the briefing process that you would have with a traditional agency. And because of that, I think that it's a much more collaborative process, but ultimately the creators know their audiences. And that's one of the reasons why they're, you know, they are able to uh, do such outstanding work. And in these last few uh, weeks and months, or the last couple of months, we have seen them turning work around at an incredible pace and incredibly cost effectively, which I think has been quite an eye opener for a lot of big brands. Fantastic. So many questions coming in, Mary. Uh, Hannah asks, do you think TikTok is reserved for a certain age group? Basically, is it tragic to download it at age 36? Question mark, question mark, question mark. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're talking to a TikToker. So, you know, I went viral for about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, it doesn't, I don't think TikTok is only about young people. I mean, I think the algorithm is so sophisticated and uh, it's, it's, very, it's very well done, the way that they've built the platform. They've definitely learned from everybody else's mistakes. So whether you're a boomer or you're a Gen Z, you know, it, it went, and anything in between, you'll, it, you'll find entertainment. It's quite easy to get lost in. And the thing that you will really notice when you go on it is just the huge vi variety of content and the massive diversity that's on TikTok, which I think we should all really, really celebrate because it's the most diverse of all of the platforms, in my opinion. We've got loads of questions all asking the same thing. How and why did Mary go viral? So if you want to answer that, <laughs> save it. <laughs> uh, so more serious question uh, up over here. Can I say too many? Anonymous, another little shy viewer. Do you think TikTok has future influencer potential or will it drop off shortly? No, I think it's definitely here for the long term. And I think the reason why is because it's been an absolutely brilliant way for um, it, for people, for people to express their creativity, to explore, you know, that spontaneity and the fun. It's, it's, it is, you know, classless in my opinion. And, you know, I think it's absolutely without, without TikTok, I think that, you know, we wouldn't have actually had the kind of traction uh, that we've had over Black Lives Matters movement, for example. Uh, it's, it's giving people a voice and it's giving them a, a means to express themselves. And I think that's incredibly powerful. So I think that we're going to see just the continued growth of these platforms. And I, I, I think that's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing for democracy. Excellent. Question here from Ellie, who asks, how do you see influencer marketing, UGC and traditional media working together? Well, what do you mean by traditional media? Because certainly right now, if you looked at the numbers, 
um, the combined uh, global audiences of Instagram, TikTok, Twitch, and YouTube are nearly 20 times the global TV audience. And, you know, that's, that's, that's what's happening. You know, traditional media is now really viewed by, you know, people like my mum, um, rather than, you know, the vast majority of people are shifting their uh, media consumption habits uh, and, their, and their entertainment habits to streaming and to their mobile phones. That's, that's, I don't think that's a reversible phenomenon. And what's really challenging for traditional media is that their models are still very much firmly based in, you know, when we, when we lived in an analog world. So the, the challenge for all of us from the point of view of the industry is we have to shape shift and we have to realize that we're not going back to the past. Cardboard engineering will never be as valued as it once was. Similarly, you know, we, and this is, and I, I do challenge the industry to this, that, you know, we have to get away from the cul-de-sac that we have built for ourselves, thinking that we know best because we went to Central St. Martins or we went to, you know, Parsons or wherever it is to become creative. Their creativity is everywhere. And what these platforms are doing is allowing people, whatever their background, whatever their education, through the use of their mobile phone, to connect with their audience and get their message across and to do that in the most creative way possible and it's huge. amazing i have to cut you off now amazing great to see you as always thank you so much thank you so much and we'll talk to you again very soon sorry to move you on so fast so we are moving on as usual fast fast and furious we're now moving across to our next incredible speaker it's phil livingston who is the former marketing director of former global director of digital sorry marketing at the body shop phil are you ready if i so, am then you've got 99 seconds and go. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I know it's a bit dry, but it's really an important topic. Um, so, hello everyone. And uh, I wanted to talk about skills in the marketing industry. If you can move on to the next slide. Nope, you haven't got my slides. Okay, fine, perfect. Uh, okay, um, so research published about two years ago from Sim and a couple of others. Um, some interesting data that came out of that, which, which basically suggested 96% believed that digital marketing skills were critical to business. I mean, no surprise there. 70% were concerned about digital marketing skills, especially amongst small businesses. But the research also highlighted significant lack of digital marketing skills against senior marketing professionals. Um, and really, um, they had a lower understanding than junior executives with one to two years experience. So, you know, for me, really, Learning and development is a lifeblood of our industry, um, but some companies are still paying lip service to this. You know, perhaps it's, you know, last on the budget line and, and first to be cut when budgets are tight. Um, and what we need is a change in mindset to create more opportunities for individuals to join, learn, and grow in a structured way. I mean, after all, career long commitment from businesses to help and support their people. Um, and, you know, what can we do to address this? Well, what we need is more rounded knowledge in, in, in more senior positions. We seem to get pigeonholed into following one route, whether that's media or creative or marketing. But when you get to a very senior level in leadership positions, more rounded knowledge is needed. I think we also need to see more cross-pollination between functions, <laughs> offline marketing. Oh, sorry, your time's up. I have to hold you a half nine, nine seconds. Uh, <laughs> one, more po one more point to make. I know it sounds mean, but I have to be the same with everyone. So All thank right. you so much. Great and a very, very hot topic. Everyone's obviously really concerned about. Now we've got one question here we can get to some cut time, which is Kyle. And Kyle says, what do you think the role of academia is? Is it pulling its weight in supporting the marketing industry? Oh, it's a good question. Um, I, I think there are lots of training opportunities and edu educational programs that people can go on. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of that is theory and, you know, a lot of learning is done on the job. So we need more support from businesses, from agencies, from brands, from advertisers that support, you know, like career long training. Um, I think academia are pulling their weight, but could they do more? Yes, of course they could. Amazing. Phil, thank you so much. We have to move on. Sorry so fast, but it's a fast paced day. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Thanks. So the next speaker is Jay Richards. Uh, quite a nice segue in from, from Phil, because uh, Jay is doing amazing work. 
are dealing with sort of getting younger generations in the industry. RJ Ridges, founder of Imogen. His really provocative title is Who the Hell Are Gen Z or Z? If you're truly familiar, I guess. Jay, you have 99 seconds and I will horn you off. Go. Hello. Hi, guys. Thank you for having me, guys. Um, so who the hell are Gen Z? Very good question. Thanks for asking. Next slide, please. They're digital natives. I know, I know. You've heard it all before. They live on the internet. They have a short attention span, blah, 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 blah. Why is it important? Because Gen Z are royalty when it comes to second screening. Next time you see vanity metrics about likes, or views, remember, they're probably watching Netflix at the same time they're scrolling. So how engaged are they really? Next slide, please. They're true activists. I know, Jay. Um, aren't millennials true activists too? Yes, we are. We love the planet. But at the same time, I'll still wear a can of the goose or drink through one of those demonic straws. Anytime you look at a protest, who do you see leading the charge? Gen Z. Brands can't get away with simply saying that they love the planet while donating 0.00001% of their um, profits to helping albino rhinos. Gen Z wants to see brands putting investment behind the social causes that they care about. Final slide, please. They are co-creators. All of the above leads to this. Gen Z want to co-create. They want to build awesome stuff with awesome human beings. Involve Gen Z in all you do, your branding, marketing, and products, and mitigate all the potential risks that your brand will face and future proof yourselves. Thank you very much. Wow, within 99 seconds, fantastic. So thank you so much. So lots of questions coming in as normal. Uh, there's one here from uh, Justine who asks, what has the impact been of COVID? That's all she yeah. said. I guess for this, you know, we read in the press all the time, this generation is really under pressure from what's happened in society in the last few months. What yes. So with Gen Z, 30% uh, of them have been either furloughed or they were the last into a company, so the first outs that have been made redundant. Um, so it's a massive impact. This is one of the reasons why I imagine we do what we do, is to enable them to get into the industry, to enable them to show how phenomenally creative they are and to work with brands in rooms that they normally wouldn't get into, which is really, really cool. Okay, excellent. Uh, Joe asked a question, what's your view on the support or not of mainstream media for this generation's aims i'm not quite sure what that means but you know how how how, how are mainstream media doing do you think um i think mainstream media is doing okay i think a lot of them are terrified they don't really know how to con have a conversation with this generation i think a lot of that's led by the fact that they don't have insights because um gen um 67 of gen z love using ad blockers so it's hard to find data and insights on them so i think a lot of time brands are quite scared about how to engage with them but they're trying you see a lot of brands as mary was saying earlier jumping onto tiktok and I think TikTok's gonna be absolutely huge, but brands can always do better. And again, I go back to engage Gen Z in your conversation. You don't have to do it with us at Imagine, do it yourselves with your audience, but if you wanna work with us at Imagine, give us a shout. <laughs> nice plug there, naughty but nice. Our question here from Eva says, what do you think about uh, this generation's use of traditional media? Have they really abandoned TV as we're so often reading? No, nah, not at all. I think, as I mentioned with second screening, um, they still watch TV, but they're going to be using their phone at the same time. So I think it's not so much about the, um, are they engaging with it? It's how much are they engaging with it, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. To what depth, to what level are they engaging with that, what you're doing on TV? So I definitely think TV still plays um, a huge um, part of their lives, um, but it's how they're engaging with it. And brands have really got to figure out um, how to deal with second and even third screening at times. Perfect. Jay, you're out of time. Thank you so much. Amazing talk and great questions. Thank you so much. See you again soon. So we're going to go across now to Laura Hewitt. Laura, if you're there, we've got 99 seconds. I am here. Thank you. Thank you. Fantastic. Go. Grab a pen and paper, everybody. Great. I'm Laura Hewitt. I'm a coach at Andus and I help teams cut through complexity. I tell my clients to start by starting. So let's create the world's biggest quickest piece of art. In the Stone Age, cavemen and women would make cave, paint, cave paintings to make sense of their most challenging experiences. So channel your inner caveman and let's draw. First, draw a circle and give it the facial expression of your most typical feeling from lockdown. You've only got five seconds for this. So five, four, three, two, one. Next up, draw the one thing you've missed the most while stuck in your lockdown cave. Yeah, we're going quick. It's pacey. Five, four, three, two, one. Great. Every caveman has a tribe. So draw the people that got you through this time. 
people that helped you. Five seconds, four, three, two, one. Now draw the weirdest thing you've done during lockdown. We've all done something. Five seconds, four, three, two, one. Now finally, draw what freedom looks like for you now. Freedom's a big thing, so I'm going to give you eight seconds. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Pens down. Great. Take a look at your creations. Any surprises? At Andus, we relish the surprise breakthroughs that our clients make when they cut through complexity and start creating. So thanks for joining me in this super simple little experiment. We'd love you to share your pictures. If you can share the next slide on the hashtag lockdown cave art at We Are Andus. We've made our own cave art painting. Well done, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic. I think that's your 99 seconds. Superb. And they, we've got a bit of an extra time because our Alex speaks with and she's uh, a new mum, so congratulations. So I think we're going to give her a bit of slack and give you a bit more time so everyone wins. Now, also, we'd also like to say, before we start getting questions coming in, don't forget you can also post all your amazing pictures. That's one from the office here. On the wall, on the app, on the... Uh, uh, another quick one here. Here, so to post as well on the wall of the app of the Mad Fest 95 Festival app. So, I'm getting some questions coming in here. Uh, Elsa asks, What has your biggest creative surprise been during lockdown? Oh, wow. Um, my biggest creative surprise is the freedom that I've experienced in this massive constraint that we've all had. So I've actually found it a really imaginative time. Um, I've started actually drawing again. My background's as an artist, but I haven't made art in ages and I've started making drawings again. And I've also been moving a lot more. So physical exercise to counteract all the kind of mental work that I've been doing. So those two things have been massively important to me. Great question. Yeah, excellent. Next one is from Holly. What do you think uh, what do you think one of the biggest? So I'm trying to screen. What do you think one of the biggest noise cut throughs will be for brands in the next year? Oh wow! I think um, the brands that really engage with spontaneity as opposed to strategy. So brands that are able to pivot more successfully, to change tack, to respond to the uncertain environment that we're all working in, will be the ones that really stand out. Uh, question here from Chris. Chris asks. How do you use this sort of technique with your clients and what's the biggest challenge in getting them to take part? Oh, super question. Um, so I'm a coach. So people often say to me, like, we need ways to get unstuck. And one of the ways I do that is surprise them at the start of the session by getting them to do um, a little technique called post-it portraits, where instead of doing the formal introductions like, hello, my name's X and I'm from X business department, we actually get them to draw a picture of each other um, on post-its and just hold it up to the camera. So it works well on a virtual uh, virtual setting as well. And that's really fun. And it just breaks out of the kind of cerebral mind and gets people drawing straight away. <laughs> Excellent. A question here from Betty, and this is sort of pretty broad, I think. She says, what is, are some of the most creative platforms and media out there? We've heard a lot about TikTok, for instance, how, how is social media helping drive creativity or not? Uh, one of the ones I'm loving at the moment is Isolated. Um, Amy, who um, you'll hear from tomorrow, will take you a bit more about, tell you a bit more about that. But it's fantastic talks for people that would normally be in the TED environment, but are now doing like virtual isolated talks. That's one of the things I'm absolutely loving. But to be honest, like the biggest prize innovations have been from individuals, um, entrepreneurs that are just making stuff from their kitchen tables, from their bedrooms. Um, I'm absolutely loving a guy called Ryan Heffington at the moment, who's um, a dance choreographer who faced with like the complete vacuum of work um, before lockdown, recreated this dance workout from his bedroom um, and from his home studio, I should say. And the people all over the world engaging with it every week, just dancing their hearts out. It's absolutely amazing. So entrepreneurs, people, just normal people doing stuff from home. Brilliant. Okay, the uh, last question, I think, time-wise, it's from Anne. Uh, she asks, a lot of the ads coming out at the moment look the same. Why does the idea of differentiation get lost on brands? Of what, sorry? What was the word there? Differentiation. That's interesting, isn't it? I think um, there's a kind of set formula that um, brands tend to follow. They think that they need to kind of replicate each other's 
um, structure and content. But I think the, the brands that really mem are that really memorable, really novel that stick out are the ones that do reinvent the wheel and do something completely different. Um, yeah, we love to be part of a brand that isn't the average consultancy. We get people making stuff straight off the bat rather than like a big strategic change project that comes from top down. So that's how we differentiate, differentiate ourselves as a brand. And I think that's um, how brands can do better by actually responding to the moment. Amazing. Laura, thank you so much. That was so much packed in such a short amount of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Very welcome. Thank you. That was fun. Now we're moving on to our next uh, incredible speaker. It's Anjali. She's the director at Story Things and runs Ada's List and does so much else besides her normal job. Don't know how she does it. I've done, you've now got 99 seconds. Your talk's called Formats Even Over Campaigns. Intriguing. So Anjali, you've got 99 seconds. Over to you. Thank you. Hi there. So I'm Anjali and I'm a director at Story Things. And I want to start by talking about something we talk a lot about at Story Things, which is, um, next slide, the attention pattern spectrum. Now, starting with when people started consuming media, back in the 1800s, uh, Telefon Hamondo started broadcasting from Budapest. And people got used to the scheduled form of viewing things. So news programs, initially, there was, you know, 30 minutes, one hour, two hours. Movies came in. People got used to that length of format. Um, and then 2000. 2008, we started seeing the, the introduction of the stream or the feed. So thanks to Facebook and Twitter and then Instagram and Snapchat, content that could be consumed in sort of seconds to minutes. That's all you needed. Right now, we're at the complete other end of the spectrum, what we like to call the, seri the series end, where it's literally multi-hour binging. And we're probably quite used to that now, thanks to lockdown, where we spend hours on Netflix, we spend hours playing multiplayer online games, whether it's on Minecraft or live streams on Twitter or whatever. Um, next slide, please. So what are formats, essentially? They're creative responses to restrictions imposed by distribution platforms. Um, they help people break out, or rather bridge, sorry, bridge the cognitive gaps in their brains because we're deluged with information today. It's a fallacy to think that what you produce is what your audience wants to see. They have a hundred other things to choose from. And so what are the restraints within which you can give them something they start associating just with you? Could be a Desert Island Discs, which is where obviously celebrities talk about their favorite music, associating them with specific memories. Could be um, Joe Sabia's uh, multiple formats. He's a VP of entertainment Conde Nast in the US. And if you haven't seen Billie Eilish's sort of one year after interviews where he asks her the same questions uh, years in a row, three, four years, I think now, uh, it's amazing. So we really force ourselves to think about what is different about the content that we produce, whether that's a podcast, whether that's a graphic, a, a graphic comic series that we literally just released about uh, the AI and collective intelligence, or an animation really about uh, the future of work. Sorry, um, to get people that's thinking about Formats, not campaigns. They'll help stick. And with that's them. it. And that's it. Yeah. To Thank you so much. That was just over, and that was my my big day. Thanks so much. Amazing talk and a great thing. I'm a, a great continuation of our day. So lots of questions coming in, and the first one I've got here is from uh, Yuki. Yuki, I think it is, uh, who asks, "We've seen today that the Telegraph is going to close or slow down its branded content arm, uh, Spark. What do you think of branded content generally and its prospects?" Great question. Um, I think over the years, branded content, I mean, whether it's uh, T-Studio, New York Times, or, or any other brand, um, they've, they've started bringing a lot of this in-house to think, to, to bridge the gap between sort of getting agencies to do it and uh, uh, doing it themselves. I think there is a future, but because a lot of the talent that they recruit are actually people who have worked in studios, worked as journalists. Um, the problem is finding the angle that resonates with people is, is not easy because the minute it's brand it becomes commercial and commercial isn't what a lot of people want to see there isn't a lot of brand content that stands out as being memorable because they always have that label to them we do some work with uh, brands um, but it's not officially branded content because our briefs are always we do not want to be up front and center you know keep the brand as far away as possible and talk about the cause talk about talk about our so the social impact or the story the protagonist as we like to to call them so find a, a person or a cast of characters and that's something that I don't think branded content does very well so um yeah yeah they have a future but i think it's it's hard to get it right perfect okay we've got a question here uh this is from alex uh does does anjali see 
see more value in the series side of consumption compared to that uh, of the short burst social media consumption? I think they both have a role, but I think series is where you can really elaborate on, on your message. Um, and it's also a way for your audience to start building a relationship with you, uh, which is tricky when it comes to marketing, because a lot of the work is done you sort of in short bursts, three, two to three months, weeks, even long campaigns. Um, and I think it's important now as we, as the world changes so rapidly, um, we, we need to get used to the fact that people are going to ideally want something to hold on to so yeah i do see series being more important the shorter form content sorry uh the shorter form content will be will be there to support support things like series i think but they, they their posters and stuff can stand on their own when there are good messages but i don't think they will have a long shelf life so if you want a long shelf life and memory then i would say go for series excellent answer okay question here from Thelma. she asks attention seems attention seems to be getting seems to be a metric getting lots of attention in advertising. So how, how can storytelling get more attention? Um, I th great, that's a really good question. I think it's um, it's focusing on the narrative as opposed to the news uh, or the, uh, the the in thing. Um, when you talk about whatever issue it is, I mean, we do a lot of work around financial inclusion, around uh, STEM, uh, and these are for corporates actually. Um, try and nudge out, tease out what the the what me what what's important to the people that you're representing, that you want to talk to. Um, I think that's what's going to help uh, in the long run. Fantastic. Question from Scott who asks, what sort of budget do I need to go into content? A lot of the stuff you're talking about seems to need a lot, seems to need a very high budget. Can be quite high, yes, um, but it can be it can be as low as you want. So, if, plenty of people now are producing podcasts from from their homes. There are a set of things that you need to do to make sure that it looks and sounds professional. Um, but you can do it for as little as a few thousand pounds if you want to go really professional. Then that's where you have to start thinking about things like script writing. Um, you know, working with talent that talent in front of the screen, for example, that's expensive because obviously celebrities cost a lot when you want to feature. But it's the stuff that's behind the screens that's more important, and we do a lot. For I would say I've worked at the media agencies and the like, so I would say for not a lot of uh, money. Um, and to you know, if you want to do things like gifts, for example, you can do it with next nothing so i think you can uh you can do it at both ends of the spectrum it depends uh how much budget you've got and really how how much bang for the buck you you want to see perfect a uh, question here from gregor who says should i be looking to build talent from within my own company i, I think guess, so. yeah happen next if so how yes okay so i think um uh, it is a, a missed opportunity if you don't work on talent within your own company, especially younger people. And we heard from Jay a bit earlier. I mean, there are, there are, there's absolutely amazing talent and there's no way that someone who is, you know, middle-aged or above can claim to understand exactly what uh, the younger people uh, do and think on a day-to-day -day basis. So I would say absolutely yes, um, especially when you have, you can, you can, you know, create, fabricate a studio quite uh, cheaply in, in a building um, or in your own room if, if you're still going to be a lockdown for a long 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 period of time um, but I think it's important not only if to to nurture them uh, but to get the best out of uh, the resources that you have um, and they sometimes bring perspectives that in fact very often uh, perspectives that you just won't won't see otherwise so yes absolutely tap the time that you have uh, you can do it cheaply by lots of on there are lots of online courses get them to join communities we actively recommend our talent um, in-house we have a, a brilliant designer uh, good go to things like code bar start developing a community of designers around yourself herself for example so find those whether it's podcasting you know writing london screen academy is one where under underrepresented writers are being developed i mean there are lots of places you can uh, give them access to to resources where they in a way that they'd want to stay with you while you develop them yeah fantastic lots of great tips there and great 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 night on second talk thank you so much thank you